Well, here we go again. It's part two of our very first Storyteller Community Day, in which a bunch of us get together and tell you scary stories. Now, featured here are some newer channels, and they all need your love and support, so please, please, please give this video a listen and then go and check them out. Oh, um, I'm in some of them. Oh, actually, I'm in the first one, but a bunch of really, really talented people here who are newer to the game than I am, but they deserve your attention, so... Yes, you're right. It's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. Well, our opening tale of terror this evening is My Friend Was Raised to Know the Exact Date of Her Death by Hyper Obscure. This story features the vocal talents of Musi's Modern Dreffles and you good doctor. That's right, I'm in this one. He only knew Michelle for a month, but it was truly a month to remember. I first met her when she was carving out my high school bully's eye with a butter knife, and we were more or less inseparable after that. She was a few years older than me, so of course I fell instantly in love, but I knew deep down we were destined for friendship and little else. Well, I knew this deep down because she made it clear that she was going to die in roughly a month. Can't love a dead chick, she'd say. At first I thought it was just a clever way to avoid the awkwardness of turning me down, but at some point I became close to believing her. There was just something about her, something extremely free, careless and unconfined, refreshingly brave and outspoken and honest. When I met her, I was going through the most depressing period of my life. I was constantly bullied and belittled at school. My younger twin sisters were both hospitalized, each needing a transplant to survive. Jenna needed a heart, Chloe needed kidneys. My parents had their hands full covering the medical expenses. I think we all, in our own ways, were on the verge of just giving up, of just letting go. I was saved by Michelle, I've no doubt about it. If she hadn't shown up when Brett was beating the shit out of me, I would have killed myself that day. I was just so sick of it. Sick of the beating, sick of the abuse, sick of being alone. But Michel came out of nowhere, threw him into the wall, knocked his nose halfway up his brain, and proceeded to dig out his left eye with the aforementioned cutlery. He never touched me again. You'd think she'd get into trouble after doing something like that, but it was never reported. Brett claimed it had been an accident, that he'd crashed with his moped. I think he feared that Michelle would kill him if he said otherwise. And I, for one, have no doubt that she would have. That was just who she was. Michelle never went to school. She said it was because she knew she was going to die. Why bother with bullshit like school then? Uh, she was all about enjoying life to the fullest. Kicking assholes in the face. Fucking over people who fucked over others. She wanted to leave this world a better place than she found it. And by her logic, this was done exclusively by ridding it of shitbags one way or another. How do you know you're gonna die? I asked her once. My parents tell me. She said. Every day. And they're good for their word. Well, she wouldn't explain it in detail. Just that she was raised knowing the exact date and time of her death. Down to the very second that it was meant to be. Well, that's what they told her. In death, her life would have meaning. At first, I didn't think much of it. You know, she was a crazy girl, and she always said weird stuff like that. I was kind of banking on it all being some bizarre joke or something. But when the month drew to a close, I was getting really worried it might all be true. I'd grown too attached to her. Every minute I wasn't at school or the hospital was spent with her and... The thought of losing her, my only friend, made me horribly depressed. That last week I was really on edge. The twins were in bad shape and my parents were spending every waking minute at the hospital. They'd yet to find any donor matches and time was running out. It felt like my time was running out too. The dark thoughts were returning and I started imagining how I'd kill myself should Michelle ever leave me. I found it strange that she'd never invited me home. I mean, friends do that, right? Invite each other over. She'd been to our house several times. 
She even crashed on the couch a few times, and we'd often watch movies there, raid my parents' liquor cabinet, get wasted, and generally just have fun. But I'd never been to her house. Not once. I didn't even know where she lived. So one night I just decided to follow her. <laughs> what was there to lose, really? Maybe I could get some answers from her parents or something. Some way to explain why she was so convinced she was dying. Maybe they'd lied to her. Some sort of cult. A way to form her beliefs into accepting the unacceptable. A way to control her. I stalked her for 30 minutes, lurking in the shadows as she paced down the streets. When she headed to the outskirts, I started getting worried, and when she took the narrow trail through the forest, I was almost having a full-on panic attack. Where the hell was she heading? As far as I knew, there weren't any houses for miles. About halfway into the forest, I suddenly lost her. It was like she'd vanished without a trace. I walked back and forth, up and down, but there was just no sign of her at all. Eventually I had to give up and return home, my mind growing even darker. I remember the last day like it was yesterday. Every minute of it. Crisp and clear and vivid in my mind. Every scent, every sound, every muscle moving on her perfect face, all those smiles and kind words... Everything. Well, the last day came and went, but I didn't know it was the last day. I mean, if I'd known, I would have told her how much I cared for her, how much she meant to me, how much I owed her my life and sanity. Without her, I wouldn't be alive, but, well, I didn't know, and I never told her. I hope she somehow realized it, that she could see it in my eyes and actions every day, but I can never be sure. She just acted so normal, you know. She was Michelle that day too, same carefree spirit, the same wild, devil-may-care attitude. We spent the afternoon smoking weed, watching silly cartoons, laughing and just enjoying each other's company. But when she left, I knew something was up. I don't know how, I guess there was some detail, some little thing that alarmed me. But having replayed and analysed that day over and over in my mind, I can't think of anything. Nothing, but <laughs> I knew. So I followed her again. This time I stayed closer, always having her in my sights, always knowing exactly where she was. She was walking considerably slower that night, almost like she knew I was behind her, almost like she wanted me to follow her. The air was cold and crisp, and whenever autumn draws close, I can step outside, take a deep breath, and relive the exact moment when she suddenly turned on her heels to face me. This is it, she said. This is the day I die. She walked over to me and handed me an envelope. It was light, but there was definitely something in it. A letter, perhaps. You will need this. She stroked my hair gently. When the time comes, you'll know what to do with it. I don't understand, I said. Please, let's just leave. Let's just get out of here. She smiled and kissed me on the cheek. If I concentrate real hard, I can still conjure up the smell of her perfume. This is goodbye, she murmured softly. But you will come to understand that it was always meant to be. I reached out to hug her when they emerged from the darkness. Two tall figures clad in dark robes, an old man and an elderly woman, their milky white hair flowing gently in the breeze. They had this solemn expression on their faces, the kind you'd see in funerals, an expression of acceptance to sorrow and despair because, well, it's just a part of life. Michelle pushed me away forcefully, and by the time I'd regained my balance, it was already too late. Her throat had been slit from either side of her neck. A perfect cross, left to right, right to left. Blood was squirting out colouring the dull brown of the roadside a deep shade of crimson. The robe couple swiftly stepped back into the shadows, leaving me desperately clutching the lifeless body of Michelle, screaming my lungs out, wailing like an animal into the cold night. The paramedics came ten minutes later. I have no idea who called them. Anonymous, they later told me. Well, she had no ID on her, so they asked me a bunch of questions. I didn't know the answer to any of them. She was Michelle, that's all I knew. Her name, 
was Michelle. She was my best friend, and she was the best person I'd ever met. They let me ride the ambulance to the hospital, but they quickly pronounced her dead. She'd lost too much blood, they told me. And it wasn't my fault. There wasn't anything I could have done. Well, this didn't offer me much comfort. I was devastated. Totally broken. The dark thoughts resurfacing once again, this time with more power than ever before. What's that in your hand? One of the paramedics asked. Does that belong to Michelle? I glanced at the envelope. It was completely drenched in blood, much like me. And then it suddenly hit me. I don't know what it was, but it was like she told me. When the time comes, you'll know exactly what to do with it. And so without thinking, I just handed it over to him. He sort of held it up, like, like he'd somehow see through it if he got a better angle of it before he gently opened it. Well, I'll be damned, he said. Well, I'm better now. I still have problems understanding what happened, but I am better. I've come to terms with it. The fact that everything happened just the way it was supposed to happen, and it has shaped me, shaped my life into what I am today. Michelle didn't just save me, she saved my entire family, every aspect of my life. And I guess you're wondering what was in that envelope. Maybe you'd figured it out, maybe not. It was a donor card. And as it turned out, she was a perfect match for my twin sisters. Can't love a dead chick, she said. And that's the only thing she was ever wrong about. Our next horrifying story is Wrong Turn Highway by Katie J. Olson. This story features the vocal talents of Archie Bali and Pumpkin Queen. Listen, the kids are tired. How about I take them home whilst you go home with your sister when you're ready? Amanda snorted, but I caught a glimpse of amusement in her eyes. Like you're Mr. Innocent over here. Trying to be the good guy, she replied, but she didn't object. Go. You've endured my family long enough. I think Audrey is about to revolt anyway. Do you have Danny's cold mats? I lifted them from my pocket. And did you have some of the leftovers? I laughed. Amanda, I have enough leftovers in the cooler to feed your whole family all over again. We're fine. My wife smiled and kissed my cheek. Drive safely, she said. So, with Donnie asleep in the car seat, Alain strapped into his booster with his kitty tablet, and my oldest, Audrey, claiming shotgun before placing both headphones onto her ears. We have it out. I don't mind Amanda's family. It can be a little exhausting spending Christmas with them, with all the jokes at my expense and sleeping in a tiny room with all our kids jammed in there has all been worth it. Now time to go home. The first hour going home was uneventful. The weather wasn't too bad, only a few snowflakes drifting down. It was quite peaceful, hearing the children snore in the back seat, while Audrey stared out of the window. Audrey had enjoyed herself the least, but I could understand that. At 12 years old, she was in an awkward place when it came to her cousins. The one closest in age to her was 16 and didn't want to play with a baby. When it came to the younger end of the spectrum, they were only 5 and 6. Not really fun for her to play with, but she trooped through it and now she got to go home. The dashboard clock read 11.48. When I made my turn onto the road, I thought it would take us onto a freeway home. Immediately my eldest jolted. Apparently she had fallen asleep. Dad, you're going the wrong way. I frowned. Had I gone the wrong way? A minute down the road, and I turned into a single lane dirt path. Huh, 
Audrey was correct. Sorry, sweetheart. Tried to go back to sleep. When I find a place to turn around, I will. Audrey sat up. Not sleepy. She responded, taking off her headphones. Are you and mom going to divorce? Ah, that had been on her mind. I gripped the steering wheel tighter. No, Audrey. We had a few fights, but I think we're going to come to an agreement. I said, attempting to reassure the worrying mind of my daughter. I hadn't even known Audrey had figured out Amanda and I were fighting. We kept it pretty quiet. Audrey twirled one of her headphone wires. What will happen to us if you're split? She asked. We aren't going to get a divorce, Audrey. Perhaps I sound a little snappy, but I was trying to keep my eye on the road. If someone came up on the other side, or an animal dashed in front of us, it could be lethal. I sighed and gave her a quick look. I love you, Mom, and I think she loves me too. But if something else happened, and we were to divorce, we'd ask you guys what you thought, and we'd do our best to make it fair for everyone. Ah. I could finally see the split in the trees ahead. Hey, I think we found the freeway. Ha, shortcut. We'll tell your mom about it when we see her. I trilled off. Right before we pulled onto the road, there was a green sign. Just a plain green sign with three words, spray painted in white across it. Wrong turn highway. Audrey pressed herself against the window and shivered. That's... Her voice was shaking. I swallowed. It's just someone trying to be funny. I lied. Something was wrong. Something felt very, very wrong. The four-lane highway was in horrendous condition. It was weavering about to avoid plot holes and ending up bouncing into other ones. Both Donnie and Alan awoke. Donnie, starting to will. Audrey unbuckled herself and scrambled into the back to soothe her brothers. The clock onto the dash went dead. I ignored a chill going up my spine and resolved to get the hell off this wrong turn highway the moment I could find an exit. No exit seemed to exist here, even with the other cars. And there were other cars. I recognized some models from the 80s along with limos. That's where light lay once in good condition, now covered in dings. I tried to peer into the others, but on most was a thin veil of frost, etching across the glass. I tossed my phone to the back. Audrey, try to call mom. Tell her we're lost. I heard Audrey scramble to pick it off the seat. That? There is no signal. Shit. I smacked my fist against the wheel, accidentally honking the horn. Several of the other cars around me immediately picked up the pace. Even the limo tires squealed as we were quickly left behind on the trench of the road. Like spooking a herd of deers, Audrey quietly whimpered from the back seat. That? I know, Audrey, I know. As a kid, my worst fear was getting lost. The feeling of losing your bearings, not knowing which road to turn on, it was my worst nightmare, one I thought I'd shaken off. Minutes turned into hours, there was no turns off, no exits, just frost and mists blowing up on the sides of the road. I saw cars that were probably decades old, frosting, crusting over an entire bicycle, except a small place with a windshield for the driver to see through. I nearly cried when I saw a gas station. I practically gunned it to pull over. My eyes were struggling to stay open, and I knew Audrey needed to pee. My heart sunk when I pulled up to a pump. The lights were all out inside of the building. I got out of the car and walked to the front door, pulling it open. A rush of cold air whistled through my hair. Dad? Audrey was behind me, wrapping her arms around herself. That hoodie wasn't thick enough to keep her warm. This isn't normal, isn't it? Audrey speak for. This isn't something humans can 
remotely understand? I walked into the gas station. The shelves had some goodies. I grabbed a few bags of potato chips. Alan loved chips. It might take his mind off the drive. I... I don't know, Audrey. And Dad's supposed to know how to do this. How to respond to any situation. I really don't know. Has my phone gotten any signal? Nope. She huffed as she walked to where the woman's bathroom was. No bus. Battery's not dead yet. I'll keep checking on it. You focus on driving. She pushed the door open and screamed. I dropped the chips and ran to her side, but Audrey slammed the door shut and pushed me back. Car! Back to the car! Go! 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 I had no idea what she saw, but I saw a wet patch of cloth on Audrey's jeans, and I wasn't about to ask. We bolted outside, and Audrey made a strangled sound. Dad! The car! The door! Oh God! Helen! Danny! The side door had been snared open, just enough for Charles to get out. I nearly ran into the car in my hurry to get there, looking in sight. Danny was asleep in his car seat, with Alan's tablet sat in his booster, the screen cracked and flashing distorted colors. I felt the ground give out from under me as I sank to my knees. I couldn't stand. I couldn't breathe. Audrey swallowed and looked down. Dad? There's... There's blood. I looked. There was blood. The kind of blood that came from someone being dragged and I led into the mist filled forest. It has been two weeks since I lost Alan. Two weeks since I got trapped on Wrong Turn Highway. All I could think of was how to tell my wife I lost her son. I'd always imagined what it'd been like to teach Audrey how to drive. She would be 15, 16, cranky because she couldn't get it right on the first try, freaking out when I make her learn how to use a stick shift, complaining that no one uses a stick anymore, Dad. Instead, I got no backtalk. Maybe the occasional sound of frustration, trying to avoid the fucking plot holes. But she was focused on learning, not on sassing me and getting stuck on her little things. And what do you know? She got it down fast. It helped there was never any turns or parking, just driving. Never stopped driving. Never ran out of gas. The phones never died. But I had bigger things to worry about. I pressed my hand against Danny's cheek. It burned to the touch. I carefully measured out more cold medicine and pressed it to his lips. He whined as it went down his throat, but he didn't struggle anymore. I didn't take that as a good thing. Dad? Danny doesn't have a cold, does he? Audrey was focused on the road, her scrawny hands clutching to the steering wheel. She never told me what she saw in the bathroom. I didn't want her to. Not after what happened to Alan. I pressed my lips to Danny's hot forehead. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. That's mom, remember? I tried to jump. But will Danny die? I didn't know how to respond to that. Audrey turned her head back. Her eyes filled with tears. Dad, please be honest, she whispered. I looked back at my son, my son who I could do nothing for, but scavenge cold medicine from the gas stations on Wrong Turn Highway and gave him water. I don't know, but there's nothing more I can do for him, except hope. Hope doesn't keep a fever six-month-year-old alive. I was driving when Audrey gasped. Dad? Dad, he's... He stopped breathing! Danny, no! I hit the brakes. They squealed so loudly, I felt my ears popped. I pulled over to the side of the road and jumped into the back seat. Audrey had gotten him and buckled and pulled him into her arms. Tears streaking down her face. I... I was just holding his hands. 
He looked tired and then he... Donny, I'm sorry. She wailed, clutching her baby brother to her chest and rocking him back and forth. I felt nothing. I felt tired and cold. Memories flashed through my head of taking Donny home from the hospital. How Alan chatted about he's the big brother now and how Audrey smiled and admitted how he was kind of cute. I felt numb. Audrey. I set her hands on my daughter's back. We need to take care of him. We waited in silence for a few minutes before I opened the car door. I took my son from my daughter's hands. His body limp and started to finally cool off after a few weeks of fevers. I walked onto the side of the road, nearing the forest. I saw ice, yellow ice, peeking out from the dark brambles. I felt my stomach twist as I gently laid Donny down, folding his arms onto his chest. I wished for flowers, flowers to rest on his chest, to hold on to. He looked like he was just asleep. I looked up at the things in the bushes, before taking a step back. Black tendrils of what looked like smoke leaked from the bushes, slowly wrapping around Donny cocooning him until I couldn't see him any longer. I peeled his body back and Donnie was gone, leaving only a patch of bloody grass behind. Our third tale guaranteed to frighten all is Ecological Etier by Baron von Pastor. This story features the vocal talents of Sinister Sweetheart and Baron von Pastor. But we'll be famous! Jiverney implored. I don't know, Jiv, murmured an anxious Milo. There are easier ways to get yourself killed. Jiverney had been eroding Milo's reluctance for weeks, and she felt he was cracking. Do you want to live and die at your 9 to 5 boring ass job? If you want to achieve greatness, you have to take risks, she badgered. Milo turned back to the computer screen and needlessly refreshed the page on their YouTube channel's real-time views. Barely a trickle in days. The two had been trying for years to make a go of being YouTube personalities. Their channel did everything. Let's plays, unboxings, movie reviews, theories... Heck, they even narrated the odd, scary story from Reddit. Maybe you're right. Something has to change, he said, clicking off to a news report. We are now entering the seventh month of what many are calling a real-life monster movie. Officials managed to halt the unknown creature's advance in northeastern Iowa after a desperate and controversial intervention. The full weight of the military was rendered useless in the face of this tremendous force. The only hope for humanity was an innovative plan. What the military learned is now one of the few scraps of information the public is aware of. The thing would only stop to devour corpses. Video of the creature is non-existent, and surviving soldiers are under strict NDAs as a matter of national security. To this day, no one knows what it is or where it came from. 30 square miles spanning both Iowa and Wisconsin have been cordoned off under heavy military guard. Nearly continuous shipments of corpses are airlifted into the area to attract whatever it is to the center of the zone. The video showed an animation of a helicopter setting a bundle of coffins onto the ground and then detaching the tether. Protests continue nationwide as cemeteries are exhumed against the wishes of families in an effort to keep up with demand. Milo pointed at the screen incredulously. And this is where you want to go. It could be a 300-foot fire-breathing dragon for all we know. You don't know what it is. That's the reason we should go. If we're the first ones to get footage of this thing, we'll be more than YouTube famous. We'll be famous famous. Milo let out an exasperated breath. And the roving bands of armed guards. Oh, they're only there to keep people out. Jiverney said with a grin. Milo's eyes widened as his face went pale. 
the pair arrived at Finley and Walter Funeral Home, dressed in black formal wear. They tried their best to keep the duffel bags they were carrying inconspicuous as they melded with a group of mourners. The other factor limiting their subterfuge were the hiking boots they wore. There simply wasn't room in the bags for everything, and they needed to travel as light as possible. A greeter asked them whose visitation they were attending. Giverny gave them a name she'd found online. They were directed to a calming, carpeted room, filled with the din of somber conversation. A receiving line of immediate family flanked a mahogany coffin at the back of the room. The interlopers stood off to the side and scanned for exits. Giverny tugged up on the front of her dress to prompt Milo to avert his gaze. They'd been friends and partners for years, but Giverny had made it very clear that's all they were. A station for tea and coffee was set up by an exit that appeared to go deeper into the building. Under the guise of fixing a drink, they crossed the room. Milo poured himself a tea, fiddled with a sugar packet and blew on it. An older fellow looked down at their shoes, turned, and went to speak with a huddle of people. He shot glances at them and discreetly pointed. Well, that didn't take long, Giverny said. She grabbed Milo's arm and pulled him into the hallway. He gently left his tea on the table as they bowed out of the room. The corridor lost its charming pretense the further they proceeded. At the end of the hall, a man in a suit slipped through the swinging double doors. The staff member raised a finger to chide them, but was frozen by a sob. Giverny wailed and buried her face into Milo's chest. He sheepishly wrapped his arms around her. Milo gave the worker a slow nod as he rubbed Giverny's back. The staff clenched his teeth in an awkward smile and sharply retracted the finger. He lowered his head and shuffled past them, trying to be as small as possible. No sooner had the worker rounded the corner, Giverny turned off the waterworks. <sighs> Come on, she said, wiping away tears. Totally healthy, you can weep on demand, Jiv. Their timing around lunch was almost perfect, except for the dead, the mortuary was vacant. Stainless steel drawers lined the back wall. In the center of the room were three metal slabs. A shrouded body lay on the middle one. Piled off to the side was a skid of plywood coffins. They worked together to empty two coffins and stuff the evicted bodies into empty morgue drawers. It was cramped, but they squeezed themselves and their bags into the now empty boxes. Then the waiting game began. Hours later, Giverny heard the rumble of a forklift and their pallet shifted. They both stayed silent and kept in contact via text during the truck ride to the mustering area. When the truck stopped, she heard wooden thumps of coffins being stacked. Her crate shifted and was thrown roughly onto the pile. The clank of straps ratcheting down and a man's voice saying, that's not going anywhere, told her their final transfer point was nearly complete. A thrumming of what Giverny assumed were helicopter blades started up. There was a sharp lurch, and they were aloft. To keep the time in the air to a minimum, the YouTubers had driven to a town near the restricted zone. The helicopter would likely reach a maximum altitude of 1,000 feet. On such a nice day, it would only be as cold as 62 degrees. Still, the cheap coffins weren't exactly airtight, and wriggling out of formal wear into heavier clothes was a chilly affair. They were in the air for less than an hour before Giverny felt the weightless sensation of a descent. The sensation intensified after a metallic click. An explosion of sound and smell assailed Giverny as the airborne parcel impacted the ground 
She heard wood splintering and her coffin landed at a lopsided angle. Their landing was a far cry from the gentle touchdown in the simulation. The shock of the fall was secondary to the horrendous smell. It was like someone had distilled the pure essence of a rotten corpse and then let it ferment into a ripe perfume. She threw open the lid to find herself at the top of the pile. Jiverny heard screaming from below her. Jiv, Jiv, my leg came Milo's muffled cries. She put her boots back on, grabbed her bag, and stumbled down the mound of plywood and bodies. Arms, feet, and heads served as obstacles that caught the straps of her bag and clothes. She found Milo's coffin two layers below her. Get me out of here! Shh! Shut up, it'll hear you! Jiverny hissed. A surge of nausea blasted her when she got a taste of the air. Mila whimpered when Jiverny started clearing the mangled mess that had crumpled the lower portion of his coffin. She pried away the last board to reveal Milo's ruined right leg and the larger duffel bag containing their camera. She rolled the large bag out of the box gingerly, fearing they'd be forced to use the cameras on their phones Jiverny crossed the straps over her shoulders and turned away. No, don't leave me, come back. Idiot, she thought. Jiverny found fewer and fewer bodies as she picked her way to the ground. Instead, she found older boxes stained with a strange black substance. She instinctively avoided touching the black sludge. It was impossible to ascertain the source of the ubiquitous stench, but bereft of better candidates, the slime seemed the likely culprit. They would have brought nose plugs, but assumed the corpses would be gone since the thing was supposed to be eating them. She hit the ground and hobbled over to an emaciated tree, well away from the crash site. The landscape was devoid of all life or features save for hundreds of these rancid pyramids. The first thing the pair had planned to do upon arrival was to clear the landing site. It made no sense to linger on a monster's dinner plate. The camera was indeed smashed, so Jiverny got out the phone adapter for their tripod. She set up a shot of the stack and started recording. Mila was still making a terrible racket. If anything was around, it definitely would have heard him by now. Jiverny waited until she felt safe in going back to collect him. In retrospect, it was sheer luck she wasn't placed at the center of the stack. There would have been no way to slide off the lid under the weight of those above. Milo had managed to crawl a few layers down the mountain of corpses. I hate you he said flatly. Did you really think I would leave you? I was just making sure it was safe. His resentful look confirmed that neither believed the excuse. She scooped him up and they slowly made their way back to the makeshift camp. Jiverny bandaged Milo's leg and immobilized the jagged white protrusion of a snapped shin bone. They kept vigil for hours, but nothing nearby stirred. Using binoculars, Jiverny thought she saw a person walking around in the distance. Spinning around to the north and south revealed a few more lone wanderers out in the wastes. She hadn't expected patrols within the restricted area as well. They were growing desensitized to the smell when a creak erupted from the pile. Even Milo snapped to action by lining up the shot. This was it, the moment they'd risked their lives for. All they had to do was glimpse the creature, and then get the hell out of there. Lids flew away from the stack, and a dark form came into view. It was humanoid, but it didn't seem inherently sinister. Sure, it was bigger than a person, but not the towering monster the media made it out to be. In the sights of the binoculars, 
Jiverny brought the being into focus. What the hell is it? Asked Milo. A Sasquatch? No, too small. It's a... It's a... Gorilla? The animal ripped the plywood apart like tissue and then sat on its haunches, picking away handfuls of the contents of the coffin. It was the only way to describe what she was seeing. Sitting atop of the wreckage, devouring chunks of deceased humans, was a silverback gorilla. Jiverny's heart sunk at the realization that no one would believe them. People would assume they staged the footage. And now that their subject was something one could encounter at the zoo, believability went out the window. We're leaving. Jiverny said, folding up the tripod. Maybe something else will come along? Offered Milo. What are the odds there would be a voracious corpse-eating gorilla in the middle of this wasteland unless it was the creature the government was worried about? She knew the risks going into this. Something the military couldn't control was more likely to kill them before they could escape with a video of it. At least they could go back to their mundane lives. The wind provided some additional relief by blowing the rank air back towards the pile of bodies. They packed up the bags while trying to be as silent as possible. Jiverty noticed it was actually completely silent. She hadn't heard the sounds of borns being thrown in quite a while. A horrid smell flooded their nostrils after a thud sounded behind them. Gray dust swirled around Jiverny's ankles as she whipped around to find herself meeting the gaze of the gorilla. Up close, it was clear it wasn't merely a gorilla. Sways of fur were missing, gaping wounds revealed lifeless organs. The black sludge from before lolled out of the creature's fanged mouth. It stood up bellowed a sickening roar and pounded its chest in a show of dominance. Its exposed rib cage on the left breast should have been crushed under the force of the self-inflicted blows. Milo screamed and tried his best at crawling. Without a word, Jiverny bolted away from it. She found her path instantly blocked when the gorilla launched into the air and crashed down in front of her. Again she turned, and again the monster moved to intercept. She broke east, and the gorilla relented, turning its attention to Milo. The gorilla nudged him in Jiverny's direction and huffed. Milo lay face down with his hands over his head in an attempt to play dead. With a flick of its wrist, the gorilla flung Milo a few feet in the same direction as before. Milo curled up into a ball and started screaming for help. Jiverny, despite herself, turned, and the gorilla charged towards her. She instantly retreated, which slowed the gorilla's advance. The faster she moved east, the less it wanted to do with her. The gorilla tossed Milo well in front of Jiverny. He didn't have the strength to recoil anymore and weakly reached out to her. She continued to walk past him, content with the tenuous immunity the motion seemed to grant her. The gorilla leapt gracefully next to Milo and sniffed around him. It roared and reared up, and slammed its fists into his back. The gorilla pounded relentlessly at Milo, pulverizing him into the earth. Jiverny strained to stay as unnoticeable as possible as she carefully shuffled past the scene. She craned her neck as far as she could to keep watching. The gorilla regurgitated the black slime, coating Milo's body. She hiked for hours, heading east, Without knowing where they would land, their original exit strategy was to head south until they hit the border. A few minutes after losing sight of the gorilla, she tried just that. Sure enough, the gorilla bounded in front of her and screamed in her face, corralling her onward. She stopped once, needing a break, but quickly continued her journey after hearing a rumbling in the distance. It was always nearby snacking on something, and stalking her behind airdrops. Now she shuffled forward as slowly as possible. It didn't seem to matter how slow she was, provided she was moving. 
A glimmer of hope sparked in Giverny after she spotted that person from before. Someone else was walking in the same direction as her, and she veered towards them slightly while still bearing east. As Giverny neared, the more apparent it became this was not her ticket to salvation. It was a man dressed in a suit, limping along. His gray, lifeless skin seemed to blend in with the rot soil beneath their feet. Her fears solidified when she finally saw the black sludge seeping out of his mouth and eyes. She changed her course away from him, but eventually it proved futile. More and more of these people were converging on her unknown destination. Rotting men and women in formal clothes, a few fresher-looking shamblers in military uniforms. A new dark hill skulked in the distance. As she neared, the ground became saturated and the smell unbearable. Eventually, she hit a literal wall of stench, causing her to stop and hold her nose. Roar in the distance prodded her into the reeking miasma. A mountain of corpses loomed over her. The river flooded around the blockage before trickling on. The walking dead climbed up as high as they could before adding themselves to the pile. The tainted water was up to her ankles and starting to sting her feet. Many of the shades passed her by as she did her utmost to prolong the inevitable. Even what used to be Milo caught up to her. He crawled along the squishy ground, his right foot threatening to tear away with every pull forward. His severed spine caused a portion of his midsection to drag along the mud. Pain radiated up her body the deeper she moved into the choked river. She saw Milo emerge from the water and cease moving after slumping himself at the base of the mound. She found the shallowest point she could and stopped the water up to her waist. She waited, hearing no repercussions. She surmised this was her destination. Defeated, Giverny fell backwards and floated on the corrupted water. The stinging sensation enveloped her as she joined the bloated corpses lazily bobbing downstream. Next up is, my daughter fell into a well, but I'm not sure what came back up is really her. Again, by Hyper Obscure. This story features the vocal talents of spirit voices and nerdcore creep. I never really spent a lot of time with my family. I guess most of it falls on me, but I always had an excuse, though. I have to work. Sorry, I'm busy right now. I'm tired, maybe tomorrow. You know how it goes. I don't think I felt good about it, but at the same time, it couldn't be helped, you know. I had responsibilities. Important stuff to take care of. Diane, my wife, never saw it like that, of course. She always went on and on about how I cared more about work than my family. And I did, to some extent. My family didn't need me home 24-7. They could manage without me. My company, on the other hand, could not. Priorities. I guess that's why she stuck me with Amelia when I had to drive up to Fletcher's Ridge to survey a property for potential purchase. Priorities, she told me. Get them fucking sorted. My wife was spending the day with her mother. Her health had been failing lately, and I suppose it was only a matter of time before the old bat kicked the bucket. Good riddance, I say. Not sure my wife would agree, though. The property, an old abandoned farm, was generally in a bad state, but came with a veritable shit bunch of land which I could easily flip for a massive profit to the county, with a little bit of finagling. Apparently, the place had some dark history or other, but I never bothered with the details. If it didn't somehow interfere with my plans to level the ancient shit pile to the ground, I failed to see the importance. I let Amelia run around doing whatever kids do whilst I perused the state of the place, and I guess she must have fallen into the well, 
almost instantly. Because I didn't even make it to the piece of shit house before I heard her desperate cries for help. I spent five minutes chasing her weirdly echoing voice, but it seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere at once. I was seriously starting to freak out, dark, sobering thoughts running through my head. What would my wife think? Would she notice our daughter was gone? How do I spin this in my favor? I suddenly heard right below me. Another step, and I would have tumbled right into the well with her. It was hidden more or less inside an overgrown bush, the roughly cut stones barely even visible if you didn't already know they were there. Honey? I yelled into the bush. Amelia, are you down there? Yes. She yelled back. I wasn't much of a MacGyver, if that name even means anything to anyone anymore. But I quickly realized a rope would probably be the go-to utility for this particular task. Hang on, honey, I yelled. I'll get you up. I ran to the ramshackled-looking outhouse and rummaged through piles of old garbage before finally finding a coil of rope that looked like it was strong enough to carry an eight-year-old. I was in a state of rising panic, and I felt a knot in my stomach that I simply couldn't ignore. I paused a second to embrace the feeling to let it fill every aspect of my being, before I returned to the well, quickly lowering down the rope. Can you grab it? I yelled. Yes, I got it. She yelled back. It didn't take much to pull her out, but the well must have been pretty deep, because I had to use almost the entire length of rope. As soon as she was up, I hugged her tightly and carried her to the car. She seemed fine, though. Not a scratch on her body, not even any dirt on her white summer dress. I rejoiced internally. My wife never had to know. Let's go home, honey, I said. But let's not tell mommy about this, okay? Wouldn't want to get her worried. I glanced periodically at her in the rearview mirror on the way home, but she didn't even seem phased. Maybe she was in shock. Or maybe kids are just better equipped to deal with shit like that. I shrugged mentally. Didn't really matter. She was unharmed physically. That's the important part. Keep the innards on the inside, as they say. I started to worry already the moment we got home. Amelia had been silent the whole ride, and she didn't seem like herself at all. That's the thing, though. I had absolutely no idea how she'd normally behave. Was she inquisitive and adventurous, or was she all quiet and introverted? Parents should know these things, shouldn't they? She sauntered out of the car without so much as a glance my way, and quietly disappeared inside. I followed, hesitantly, my mind racing to connect years of missing dots. You want to watch some TV? I asked. I bet your favorite show is on. I flipped through the channels idly. Sports, news, news, sports. Nothing that seemed even remotely interesting for children. After a while, I just sat down with her on the couch, twiddling my thumbs. It was becoming more and more apparent that I was hopelessly out of my element. I like talking to faces. Amelia whispered. Inside out faces, like in the ceiling. That's interesting, I offered. It wasn't, though. It was very unnerving. She was staring at the ceiling, an intense, unflinching gaze that sent shivers down my spine. If you listen really, really carefully, you can hear them talking back. I nodded weakly and tried not to look directly at her. She had an active imagination. That much seemed clear. How had I not noticed this behavior earlier? I'll go fix us something to eat, okay? I tried to feign a warm smile. Are you hungry? She turned to me and nodded energetically. But it wasn't a normal nod, you know. It was like she threw her head all the way back, then swung it forward with all her might. Kids, right? I shuddered briefly and then hurried to the kitchen. What do you like? I asked. Peanut butter? Jelly? 
The combination thereof? Anything with a soul. She whispered right into my ear. Shit! I shrieked, nearly slicing off a finger as I lost control over the bread knife. I turned on the dime, almost losing it again when I saw Amelia standing right behind me. I felt the knot in my stomach tightening again. Amelia? Uh, honey? I murmured. You okay? She was pale as snow, her pallid face drained of all color. Her hair looked different, too. How did it usually look? It wasn't normally so sickly thin and graying, was it? And then there was the issue with her brown, rotting teeth. We took dental hygiene pretty seriously in our household, didn't we? I'm famished, she grinned. Need sustenance. She seemed unnaturally gaunt, just skin stretched over bones, her dress hanging limply from the lethargic frame. She used to look healthy and lifelike, right? I'm sure she did. Please, Daddy. She gurgled hideously. Something living. She had to be sick. Some bug or virus or something. Maybe she did hurt herself down in that well after all. Caught an infection, possibly. Maybe she had rabies. I panicked, my mind struggling to find references to what I should do next. Mom, I whispered. We need to call your mom. With trembling hands, I grabbed my phone and called Diane. She'd know what to do. She always knew what to do. Honey? Her soft voice answered. Is everything okay at home? Uh, no. I mean, uh, I don't know. Maybe, I stammered. It's Amelia. Amelia smiled at the mention of her name. Only it wasn't so much a smile as it was her lips curling back, revealing nothing but blackish flesh and rotting teeth. I swallowed deeply. Amelia? She asked. Yes, Amelia! I yelled. Our daughter? There was a long pause, and I could hear her breathing heavily on the other end. Amelia was inches away from my face now, her long black tongue hanging out of her mouth limply. Her brown teeth were falling out one by one as the expanding tongue demanded even more space. Noah? Diane said. Have you been drinking during shrooms again? What? No! I yelled. I really think there's something wrong with our daughter. Why is that so hard to believe? Amelia put her writhing, worm-like hand in mine, squeezing gently. Her black hole eyes beckoned me to put down the phone. It's very hard to believe, Noah. Diane said, pausing momentarily. Because... We don't have any fucking kids. And today's final tale of terror is The Moonlight, an original work by Lady Spukaria. And this story features the vocal talents of Lady Spukaria and Nordic Vampire. The moonlight was bright in the night sky. It was always the best time to hunt. The lamplight had begun to dim. There was a moment where I paused and watched the various humans as they walked. There was always something where it came to selecting the right victim. The lure of the hunt could never be denied. To be well-dressed meant that you could have doors open to you. People always tend to respect their social betters. I saw a young woman walk, and I caught her eye. She blushed. And I knew she was the prey I wanted for the evening. The only time I felt alive 
was when I was hunting. Her clothing was elegant and the fabric expensive. She walked with a parasol in her hand. I had to wonder where her companions would be. A young lady of her status should not be walking the streets at night. There was always something so alluring about noble virgin blood. I walked behind her, watching her, and whenever she would get a warning tingle, I would hide in the alleyway. There were many different techniques for me to hunt. Yes, can I help you? I asked. She turned and looked at me, her wide blue eyes frightened, yet my attire seemed to put her at ease. I could, I could practically hear the blood circulating through her veins. Sir, please help me, I am lost. She answered. Oh, this was all too easy. Lost, you say? A shame, shame indeed. Do not worry. I will take you to safety. Do you live in the quarters? Would you like for me to escort you home? She nods. Oh, perfect. She would not make it home, Mm, no. I offered her my arm and felt her delicate hand placed on the crook of mine. As I smiled down at her, her pale cheeks flushed and I knew this was going to be easier than even I intended. Forgive me, miss. I will take you home now. It is a small walk through this alleyway, I said. A more wily woman would have been cautious and hesitant. Yet she, oh, she was more than willing. Noble virgins were always the most naive. Ah, he accepted it perfectly. I placed my hand on the crook of his arm and gave it the slightest squeeze. It was important to always give them a sense of power. I shivered, both from the cold and the thrill of the hunt. This part of the city was old, full of winding corridors and alleyways. The perfect place to escort someone secretly or lead them into the unknown. Is it faster? I asked. I hoped he would hear the joy behind my words. The lure of safety. I made sure I gripped his arm and gazed up at him. He nodded to assure me. Good sir, it is dark and I need to get home soon. The pair of us walked down the cobbled streets and I could barely see in the darkness. Instinctively, I pulled back from where I sensed danger and he embraced me. My eyes gazed into his and no doubt he expected his spell to work. This wasn't the first vampire I lured into this alleyway. I could feel her tense against the stride, turned her face towards me, and in the moonlight I could see her lips part. My hand lifted to cup her cheek, tilled her head gently to one side, and my lips parted to reveal my fangs. Slowly they lowered in desire of that pale neck. I could hear the blood pulsing in her veins. The hunger. 
I saw the fangs ready to sink into my neck. Behind me, my trembling hand held the wooden stake. Slowly, his mouth began to lower to my neck. This was always the most dangerous part, and I knew it would not take long before the teeth would sink into my neck. I wasted no time. I drew my arm back and thrust the stake into his heart. My gloves protected me from the foul blood that burst out. I stared into his eyes. I did not expect this. I shrank back and tried to stop her hand. I feel the true death begin to claim me. The sound and smell would last with me forever. I withdrew the stake and watched him fall to the ground. The undead life was slowly leaving his eyes. The blood and rotted gore spilled out as the corpse fell to the ground. I watched it fall back, revealing the skeleton, and soon it turned to dust. I adjusted my parasol, concealed the stake, and continued on my way through the darkness of night. The hunt was still on. You know what, guys? Thank you so much for listening to this one. I mean, I know you come to my channel to listen to me, and, you know, I'm eternally grateful. Thank you so much. But it's really, really important for me to try and help out some other people who are trying to do the same thing that I did. Starting from nothing building an audience and sharing stories with everybody just because we love doing it. So this is my way of um, giving back to the community. So please, please, please go and check out their channels. Give them a listen. Give them a thumbs up. Leave a comment. Subscribe. Show a bit of support. It really means a lot to me to be able to help these other guys out. And this is how I'm doing it. So yeah, go on. You know what to do. Well, tomorrow night I'm back here on my own. Yeah, just me. So... If you don't like listening to other people, I understand, but hey, come on. <laughs> Back with me again tomorrow night. Until then, my dear friends, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.